Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Well, Serafina Padilla, take the keys to your new life, said Sonora Malato, putting a bundle of three keys on a metal ring into Serafina's narrow palm. The girl stood as if in hesitation in front of the apartment door. Sonora Malato, laughing, took the keys and opened the door herself. Oh, Serafina, don't be a stranger. The state is giving you this apartment. Just come on, live and be happy, start a new life, and here you are, completely pale. Come in. The woman opened the door and pushed Serafina inside. Following her, Zoe closed the door behind her. Go ahead, look around, make yourself at home, she joked, walking into the room and pulling the curtains aside. I can't believe it, Sonora Mulatto, Serafina timidly replied, walking quietly down the corridor behind the woman. It means I'm already an adult. I can live as I want and do what I want. The girl pondered, as if realizing what it meant to be an adult. Absolutely right, Zoe said cheerfully, embracing Serafina by the shoulders. You're already a big girl, legally an adult, so you can confidently become independent right now. But, Sonora Mulatto raised her finger meaningfully, when it comes to doing what you want, there are questions. My dear, the woman switched to a serious tone. Being an adult and managing your own life doesn't mean you should do what you want thoughtlessly. Being an adult means making responsible decisions, always taking responsibility for your life. Do you understand? Serafina nodded in response. Sonora Mulatto had indeed been the caretaker of her and many other similar children in the orphanage for many years. Serafina never knew her father, and memories of her mother had become blurry and unclear over the years. She was not even six years old when her mother was deprived of parental rights due to continuous alcohol abuse and a complete lack of desire to raise her little daughter. Her mother could leave home and not return for several days, leaving little Serafina completely alone and without a crumb of bread. It was fortunate if the troubled mother managed to make arrangements with a neighbor before her next binge, which she often referred to as visiting for a while, to have her trustworthy neighbor Aunt Maria look after her daughter for an hour or two so she wouldn't get into trouble. Trying to persuade the alcoholic was pointless, and scolding her or appealing to her conscience was even more futile. Upon hearing reproaches directed at her, the mother would become furious and behave aggressively. Either the seasoned drunkard had a fit of anger, or somewhere deep within her, her conscience suddenly awakened. The mother would start yelling, showering both the neighbor Aunt Maria and her little daughter with foul street language and cursing the whole world, which so unjustly forced a person to give up what their soul desired. What your soul desires, everyone already knows, thought the neighbor in response, realizing that she herself was the only chance to help the little child survive. Serafina's mother, however, as if seeing Aunt Maria's thought process, skillfully applied pressure, starting to shout even louder. The killer argument that always worked was furious curses directed at her daughter and wishes for her to stop being an obstacle to her mother's endless revelry. Damn me for giving birth to this stupid brat. She shrieked. I wish she'd just dropped dead. Who needs her? A cursed burden, like a millstone around my neck. May you not exist in this world. My whole life is a mess because of you. As a rule, this deadly argument instantly affected Aunt Maria. What are you saying, you wretched woman? The neighbor exclaimed. Wishing death upon an innocent child. Come to your senses. But Serafina's mother, upon hearing these words, instantly calmed down, realizing that the manipulation had worked this time, and that meant she could confidently embark on another spree. Oh, come on, Aunt Maria, I'm just joking. I'm not serious at all, in a figurative sense. And you're so kind, caring, always willing to help. I'll just take a short walk nearby. It's good to change the scenery once in a while. It's not all about staying at home and dealing with chores all the time. The cunning mother knew what she was doing. The kind neighbor wouldn't abandon the orphan child, so there was no rush to go home. They would figure things out somehow without her. I am kind, that's for sure, Aunt Maria remarked in response. But as for you, all you ever do is change the scenery. 
Your daughter is left alone endlessly. There is no food in the house. The fridge is turned off. If only some dried up Snickers from those fellow drinkers you trade your attention for would be lying on the kitchen table. But the mother was already unstoppable. Hastily applying lipstick in front of the murky old mirror in the hallway, she retorted to the neighbor with something like, don't meddle in my personal life, and instantly disappeared in a direction only she knew. She disappeared without even looking back at her daughter in farewell, only to reappear on the doorstep in a week or two, stumbling from the consequences of her wild lifestyle, and fall into a deep sleep like the dead. Once, Serafina's mother disappeared for a month, and the concerned neighbor began to fear that the woman was no longer alive. She went to the police, taking little Serafina by the hand. The mother was found soon after. To Aunt Maria's horror, it turned out that the girl's unfortunate mother had also become a drug addict. Somehow, she ended up 500 kilometers away from their hometown and was lying in a local hospital with a severe drug overdose. The police, raiding the den, found her unconscious among a group of equally destitute souls. The drug-fueled company paid no attention to the comatose addict. A couple more days, and her bender would have logically ended in her departure from life, unnoticed by anyone. However, now the issue of motherhood became a pressing concern. Child Protective Services initiated the process of stripping Serafina's mother of her parental rights. The recovering addict lying in the hospital bed seemed relieved to hear the news. With poorly concealed joy, she signed all the papers, eager to be discharged from the hospital and start a free and unrestricted life. Fina moved to an orphanage. Her neighbor, Aunt Maria, concerned about the fate of the child to whom she had devoted so much of her time and effort, visited the girl regularly. Contrary to her fears, the orphanage in their town was not a scary and monstrous place. The caregivers who worked there were neither monsters nor those who callously traded defenseless wards for personal gain. They were kind and good-hearted women who cared for the orphans as if they were their own children. The neighbors soon realized that little Fina was doing well. The girl started eating and gaining weight. Her cheeks turned rosy and her fiery red hair curled sweetly. Sonora Mulatto, one of the caregivers, burst into laughter upon seeing Fina. Who is this little firecracker that has come to us? She exclaimed. I've never seen hair of such a bright red color. Give me matches to light them. Soon, the girl adjusted to her new life. Sonora Mulatto did everything to help her socialize within their small community, make friends, and feel like a part of their warm community. Fina's mother, upon leaving the hospital, never once thought of her daughter. She never returned home. Soon, Aunt Maria received a police summons to identify a body. Fina's mother had no relatives, and involving her drinking buddies in the identification process was unlikely to cross anyone's mind. They often couldn't even remember who they were or where they came from. In a neighboring city, the river washed up a woman's body that matched the description of Fina's mother. In the pocket of her waterlogged coat, the police found a passport, damaged by moisture, that belonged to her. The body had been in the water for about a month, and it was impossible to determine the drowned woman's appearance with certainty. Aunt Maria, who came to identify the body, crossed herself and looked at the deceased. However, she couldn't say for sure whether Fina's mother was lying before her on the morgue's pull-out shelf or not. It wasn't necessary for anyone to find out for certain. The police had enough on their hands investigating the demise of the lost alcoholic and drug addict. The body was buried under the name of Fina's mother, and now the girl was officially considered an orphan. In the orphanage, Fina quickly recovered. She turned out to be a very talented and intelligent child. Sonora Mulatto, who had no children or husband of her own, dedicated her life to caring for orphaned children and constantly engaged with Fina. When it was time for Fina to go to school, she could already read children's books fluently, loved poetry, and even tried her hand at writing verses. For her birthday, the caregiver gave Fina an album for her own poems with a beautiful glossy cover, and Fina began to write her own compositions in it. As avid reader, Fina was a frequent visitor to the regional library. She loved coming there, relishing the library's quiet atmosphere and the scent of the books stored there. And then she realized that she wanted to become a librarian when she grew up. 
Sonora Mulatto, who essentially stepped in as her mother, wholeheartedly encouraged her interest in books and reading. If you want to become a real librarian, get used to being neat and responsible, Sonora Mulatto would say to Fina. And remember, a librarian's task is to inspire people's interest and love for reading. When Fina finished school, she already knew for certain that she would be applying to an institute related to literature. In the city, there had long existed a society of book lovers, literature enthusiasts, and poets. Of course, Fina was a regular attendee of this community. Its members included amateur poets and writers who regularly organized readings of their works for the community members. Fina had participated in such evenings multiple times, and everyone in attendance unanimously agreed that the young poetess had only one path in life, literature and poetry. One evening, among the regular members of the community, a new person appeared. He was an elderly man in his 70s, of rather respectable appearance, who arrived at the community event in a foreign retro car with a driver and had a habit of smoking a pipe with fragrant tobacco. When Fina read her poems, the man enthusiastically applauded louder than anyone else and prophesied a bright literary future for the girl. In the city, he was considered a newcomer. It was said that not long ago, he had moved here from capital, buying a house and deciding to exchange the round-the-clock noise of the big city for the tranquility of the provincial suburbs. One evening, Don Barcenas, as the man was named, invited those gathered after the community event to his mansion to celebrate his birthday. Some people rushed home, others had other commitments that evening, but a few people, including Fina, gladly accepted the invitation to Don Barcenas's house. In the spacious living room of his house, a table was already set with champagne. Fina, who was 17 at the time, had never tasted alcohol. However, when they placed a delicate glass filled with golden sparkling drink in front of her, she found it awkward to refuse. The evening passed in a warm and sincere atmosphere. The host himself only drank mineral water, citing doctors' strict orders against any alcohol. At the end of the evening, Don Barcenas asked his driver to take Fina back to the orphanage and hand her over to the caregivers. Sonora Mulatto, sensing a faint smell of champagne from Fina, became worried. When she found out where the girl had been, she gave her a lecture about not trusting every man. Among them were corrupt lovers of young girls, from whom one should stay as far away as possible. However, soon Don Barcenas personally came to the orphanage. The director and Sonora Mulatto were surprised by his visit and prepared to be on high alert for the sake of their child. Anyone could turn out to be such a visitor, and they couldn't be too careful. Don Barcenas, however, arrived with a proposal and asked those responsible for Fina for permission for her to help him organize the extensive library in his house. I've heard that Serafina dreams of a career in librarianship, said the man to the director and the caregiver as he settled into a chair in the director's office. And I can see where her love for books and reading comes from. He observed the tall bookshelves lining the entire wall, filled with books. The women responded cautiously to Don Barcenas's unexpected interest in Fina. His sudden interest seemed suspicious to them. Noticing this, the man laughed and reassured them. I understand your skepticism, but you're worrying for no reason. I just want to help a gifted girl realize her dream. She's genuinely passionate about library work, not fashion and cosmetics like many other young girls of her age. I have two grandchildren myself, but unfortunately, I can't say the same about them. They have completely different interests, whereas Fina's enthusiasm for books and reading is truly remarkable. In my library, over the years, thousands of books have accumulated. Some are even quite rare and valuable. Upon hearing that the unexpected visitor himself had grandchildren, the women relaxed a bit. However, the director, looking at him, said seriously, Well, we certainly don't mind Fina developing herself and participating in such activities, especially since she plans to enter the institute next year. However, we will always keep an eye on our ward, and if anything happens, rest assured we won't let any harm come to her. She added sternly. Well, I see that our future is in capable hands, Don Barcenas joked in response. But you're absolutely right to take this matter seriously. Let's do this, he said, addressing the director, 
I will install a surveillance camera in my library, and you will be able to see what Fina is doing in my house at any time. What do you say to that? Well, let's give it a try, the director of the orphanage said relieved. Fina, upon learning of the upcoming task, was overjoyed. Don Barsinis's house indeed had numerous books, and the opportunity to sort through them was like a dream come true for her. When the visitor left, and a happy Fina exited the director's office, the women exchanged doubtful glances. He still seems rather strange, Zoe, the director said to the caregiver. He doesn't really seem like the type who's interested in young girls, but there's still something suspicious about him. Well, it's unlikely that we'll be able to dissuade Fina from this task now, Zoe replied. He was honest when he came to consult with us. Even if he hadn't come, Fina would have found out about it from him anyway. Let's see how things go. Perhaps the girl will benefit from it. That was the decision they made. Fina helped Don Barcenas mainly on weekends. Early in the morning, she would hurry to his house to immerse herself once again in the unique world of various books, of which there were a great many in the library. Don Barcenas usually waited for the girl with a set table for breakfast. It was unusual for Fina to sit at a table with starched napkins and fine china while the housekeeper poured her coffee or served hot pancakes with jam. However, Don Barcenas was an interesting and knowledgeable conversationalist, and Fina soon forgot about the surroundings, engrossed in yet another captivating discussion. Sonora Mulatto, however, kept a close watch on how her ward spent her time in that house. When Fina turned 18, her caregiver became especially serious. Fina, now you're an adult, she told the girl. Soon you'll start living on your own in your own apartment, which is provided to every orphanage graduate. But by then, according to the law, we won't be able to legally control your life anymore. Do you understand? Of course, you can always count on us, but all decisions related to your relationships with other people, especially with men, you will have to make on your own and only on your own. Always remember that your own desires and interests are paramount. Never give in to persuasion if someone tries to make you do something you don't want to do. Don't agree to anything like that, even if they offer you money for it. If you see it, run away from such people. Fina understood what Sonora Mulatto was talking about and who she was talking about, but Don Barcenas had never done anything like that to her. On the contrary, he behaved like a caring grandfather, as if he were Fina's own family. The girl, who had never had a grandfather or even a father, was delighted with such treatment. Don Barcenas enjoyed asking questions and often sought Fina's opinion on various situations that occurred in life. Sometimes they even had differences, not always agreeing with one another. Fina's caregiver, Sonora Mulatto, didn't quite understand this friendship, always looking for hidden motives in Fina's interactions with Don Barcenas. However, no matter how much she looked, she never found anything suspicious. And now, the day had come when Fina, her longtime ward, with her bright red curly hair, had to become completely independent and free from the opinions of the only people who genuinely wished her well. Standing next to the young woman in a new apartment, Sonora Mulatto realized that her bright spark was not quite ready for adult life. But what could be done about it? Fina couldn't stay in the orphanage forever, and it was time for her to start growing up. Having her own apartment was very timely for the beginning of an independent life, especially since the house where Fina was born had been demolished and the residence had been resettled, so there was no place for her to return to. So, Fina, are you taking charge here? Sonora Mulatto asked cheerfully, looking around the apartment. You'll get a job for now, maybe in the nearby store. I've arranged it. They'll hire you as a saleswoman. And in the meantime, you can prepare for your college entrance exams. I've taught you a bit about cooking, so here you go, Sonora Mulatto continued, moving to the kitchen. You've got a refrigerator, a gas stove, everything you need. Use them and take charge like a true hostess. Here, take this for the time being. The caregiver picked up a bag from the floor and placed it on a stool, unzipping it. We've gathered some dishes and bed linens for you. Use them, and you can buy whatever else you need later. 
Zoe spoke tirelessly in a deliberately lively tone, but Fina understood that her caregiver was worried about her, hiding her concern behind her chatter. Sonora Mulatto, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. We'll still see each other even every day, just like before, the girl reassured her caregiver. Well, how can I not worry when for so many years we were always together, and now? How will everything work out? Zoe sighed. Okay, you're right, there's no need to worry. I have a lot of things to take care of today. Ladies hugged, and Fina locked the door behind Sonora Mulatto. A new life. That's what it is, Fina thought as she unpacked her bag. Suddenly, her phone rang. Upon learning that Fina was celebrating her birthday, Don Barcenas insisted on giving her a personal gift and handed her a new mobile phone. Refusals are not accepted, he said, seeing Fina's hesitation about accepting the gift. After all, I want to stay in touch with my assistant. What's so strange about that? Fina answered the call, and it was indeed Don Barcenas asking her to come over today. She promised to be there soon, as soon as she unpacked her things and got settled in her new place. Within an hour and a half, she was entering Don Barcenas's mansion. The host, holding a book in his hand and smoking a pipe with aromatic tobacco, sat in an armchair by the fireplace in the living room. So, how are you settling in? He asked when he saw Fina entering. Come in, have a seat. And while you're at it, Tell me where you've decided to work before entering college. Fina sighed in response. She didn't really want to work at the store where Sonora Mulatto had arranged for her. I don't really want to work in that store, of course, but where else can I go? She said. Well, you don't have to work at that store if you don't want to, Don Barcenas said. In fact, I wanted to offer you something. What do you say if I hire you myself? You'll do the same things you're doing now, organizing my library, helping me catalog books, and sometimes just keeping me company. After all, we're friends, aren't we? Fina smiled in response. She liked the offer, but remembering Sonora Mulatto's guidance and warnings, she hesitated and said, That would be very nice. Thank you for your care and support, but Don Barcenas, why are you showing such kindness to me? You have your own grandchildren and children, I assume. You never talk about them. Fina, my dear, Don Barcenas said thoughtfully, as if deciding on something, and continued, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, and now I think the time has come. Look. He took a photo out of the book he had been holding and handed it to Fina. It was a picture of a young man with fiery red, curly hair. Fina looked at the photo with puzzlement, not understanding why Don Barcenas was showing it to her, and asked, This must be some relative of yours, maybe your son or grandson. Well, not a grandson, Don Barcenas chuckled. But you're right, he's a relative. And not just a relative, but my own son, he said, suddenly becoming serious. A son who, unfortunately, made many mistakes in his life and has now left this world. Sadly, what happened to him? Fina asked sympathetically. Please tell me. It's a sad story, Don Barcenas replied. Probably, as a father, I didn't pay enough attention to my son and trusting his upbringing to my wife and various nannies, he shook his head mournfully. I'm wealthy, Fina, very wealthy. I inherited a multi-billion dollar business from my father, which I have further expanded in my lifetime. However, I overlooked the most important thing, passing it on. When I was young, I foolishly believed that making money, growth, and prosperity were the main values. I missed out on many things, not understanding the role of a father in raising his child. And my only son grew up as a complete egotist, used to the idea that the whole world revolved around him. His caring mother surrounded him with luxury and attention from a young age, asking for nothing in return. The boy grew up with a sincere belief that everyone owed him, and he owed nothing to anyone. But me? What was I thinking? Now it's too late to change anything. The path my son chose for himself ultimately led him to ruin. The old man sighed and fell silent. 
Fina listened patiently, feeling sympathy for him, but still not understanding the purpose of this conversation. After a pause, Don Barcinus continued. From a very young age, my only son, Pasquale, showed a propensity for a corrupt and aimless life. Always having pocket money in unlimited quantities, he learned about alcohol, debauchery, and later, illegal substances at an early age. By the time he was 18, he was a full-fledged alcoholic who indulged himself without restraint, often living a reckless life. When I realized this, it was already too late. His mother fiercely protected him, hiding his escapades from me. I learned much later about his exploits from outsiders. My wife and I began to seriously quarrel over our son, which eventually led to the complete breakdown of our marriage. After the divorce, she moved away, demanding separate housing for herself and our son, as well as substantial monthly financial support. From this point, I had no influence over Pasquale whatsoever. Sometime later, my wife informed me that our son was getting married. Unfortunately, the girl he chose to marry turned out to be a gold digger targeting wealthy men. After the wedding, Pasquale didn't change his lifestyle at all. I tried to talk to him to explain that his life should take a different path now that he was a husband and head of the family. In response, my son, who had been drinking all night and had only slept for a couple of hours, barely able to stand on his feet, laughed in my face. Oh, please. Pasquale scoffed. The conversation took place in the morning, and his alcohol-laden breath was practically in my face. Getting married wasn't my idea. It was a goddess, he continued in a drunken stupor. She decided to get married, and what about me? I agreed to it just for fun, he chuckled. Pasquale's young wife, Agata, was pregnant. It seemed that she had no concern about her husband's lifestyle. The marriage lasted just over three years, during which Agata gave birth to another child. Believing that she had now secured her future through alimony for their two children, she calmly filed for divorce, and Pasquale didn't care at all. After the divorce, I bought a new apartment for my son and then for his ex-wife, where they moved. My son continued to live the same way and soon brought a new girlfriend into his life. She was a perfect match for him, young and already a seasoned alcoholic. Now my son's apartment had turned into a real den of iniquity. I constantly received complaints from neighbors and I tried to talk some sense into my son myself. One day, when I went to see my son and once again attempted to persuade him to straighten up, he solemnly announced that his girlfriend was pregnant. The future mother, who sat next to Pasquale, hugging him, didn't seem to care about her condition at all. She was smoking a cigarette and, with a drunken laugh, took sips from a glass of strong alcohol. Dad, you have to have a drink with us to celebrate the health of your new grandchild, my son slurred as he poured a substantial amount of brandy for me. The company of revelers, which was always present at my son's place, cheered approvingly. Empty bottles crashed to the floor with a clatter. The intoxicated group sent a guy to the store for more alcohol. But I understood one thing, if my son's girlfriend was indeed pregnant, then we needed to save the future grandchild. Under the pretext of getting acquainted with the future mother, I took her out into the hallway and drove her straight to the hospital. She snored in the back seat the entire way, seemingly indifferent to where or why she was being taken. At the hospital, we helped her sober up and made sure she got some rest. The next day, I went to pick her up, but before taking her home, I talked to the doctor. It turned out that the young woman was indeed pregnant, and it was already too late for an abortion. However, the future mother, who seemed completely indifferent to her condition, demanded to get rid of her hangover and have a cigarette. That's when I decided to intervene, taking the girl to my home and keeping her under the watchful eye of two nurses and a housekeeper. My son's girlfriend's name was Kate. Realizing that her wild lifestyle had come to an end, she caused a terrible scandal throughout the house, refusing to be locked up and demanding immediate release. But I was determined not to give in. Listen, Katerina, I said to the rebellious pregnant alcoholic, let's make a deal. You'll live with me for a few months, completely abstaining from alcohol and tobacco from this day forward. If you behave yourself, you'll live like a queen. Then, when the time comes, you can give birth and go on your way, 
leaving the child here. And for that, I'll pay you a substantial fee, and hopefully, I'll never hear from you again. Well, that sounds good. Kate responded eagerly. The amount he mentioned clearly surprised her. It seemed that her mind was working overtime, calculating the number of bottles she could buy with that kind of money. Katarina agreed to live in Don Barsinas's house. Of course, he suspected that the pregnant woman wasn't carrying his son's child. Given her lifestyle, she could have had multiple partners, and it was impossible to be certain. However, Don Barsinas believed that he must save this child, whoever its father might be. So, did this girl give birth to another grandchild for you? Serafina broke the silence. No, unfortunately, the old man replied. Katerina managed to escape from my house shortly before giving birth. She repeatedly tried to persuade the staff to release her, but to no avail. Soon, tragedy struck. My son died of alcohol poisoning in the hospital. My ex-wife, who attended the funeral, accidentally learned that Katerina was living in my house and was soon to give birth to my son's child. She realized that this child would become the third heir to my fortune and decided to eliminate the unnecessary heir. I couldn't understand why my ex-wife suddenly started visiting my house under various pretexts and regularly sent my grandchildren to me, even though they hadn't thought about me for months. I don't know how she managed it, but one morning, Katerina's room was empty. Both nurses were sleeping soundly beside her door. The housekeeper and I couldn't wake them up. The women were clearly drugged. But you found Kate later, didn't you? Serafina asked impatiently. I didn't find her right away, Don Barsinas sighed in response. She disappeared as if she had never existed. I hired a detective who searched for Katerina throughout the country because there was still no certainty that she had survived her lifestyle and had given birth to a child. It was only a few years later that her trail was discovered in a small town, but I realized I was too late. Katerina was no longer alive by that time. And the child? Were you able to find the child? Serafina impatiently asked Don Barsinas, who fell silent and seemed lost in his thoughts. I did, it was a girl, Don Barsinas replied with a smile. But not right away. In the city where Katerina was buried, she was a stranger. She led a homeless life, wandering the surrounding areas with people like herself. No one had ever seen her with a child, and no one could say whether she had a child or not. I had already concluded that Katerina either never gave birth or had a stillborn child, which wouldn't have been surprising given her lifestyle. But it soon unexpectedly became clear that the child did exist. Don Barsinas' voice trembled with emotion. Katerina gave birth while living in another city. Her parental rights were terminated there, and her child, a little daughter, was placed in an orphanage for upbringing. I couldn't believe that the search had finally paid off, and I decided to personally confirm it. When I saw the girl, all my doubts about my son's paternity disappeared instantly. This girl was an exact copy of Pasquale, my son. Don Barsinas fell silent, unable to contain his overwhelming emotions. Serafina patiently waited. Finally, the old man, having composed himself, continued. I didn't immediately reveal my identity and observed the girl for several years. The more I observed her, the more convinced I became. My granddaughter, thank God, took after me rather than her father. She's a talented, smart girl. She was so different from my two other grandchildren. Raised by their mother, Agata, a money-hungry opportunist, and my ex-wife, they know no other values in life besides money. For them, there is nothing else but self-interest, but they are petty, malicious underachievers. I always knew that if something happened to me, I would never entrust them with my business. But now I'm at peace, Don Barsinas smiled joyfully. Now I know who can be my successor. And I'm so proud of her. Do you want to know who this girl is? Don Barsinas asked mischievously. Intrigued by his story, the girl eagerly nodded in response. The old man paused solemnly, looked at her again, and said, This girl is you, Serafina. How can it be me? Serafina seemed completely puzzled and continued to look at the old man with astonishment. 
I don't understand anything, she muttered. Fina, it's true, Don Barcenas laughed. Imagine, you're my granddaughter. When I first saw you, I realized it in an instant. Who else could have such fiery red hair? You're one of us. So, I'm the granddaughter you've been telling me about? The girl said in amazement. So, I'm your granddaughter, and you're my grandfather? The old man silently nodded in response to Serafina's joyful question. And my mother is Kate. I never knew my father and grew up in an orphanage after my mother lost her parental rights. That's right. That's right. The girl couldn't contain her happiness anymore. Don Barcenas, Grandpa, is this really true? How happy I am that it's you who's my grandfather. Serafina, leaving behind any remnants of doubt, lovingly embraced her grandfather. Don Barcenas also beamed with happiness. But why did you only tell me this now? Serafina asked after pulling away. Yes, Fina, only now, and there are reasons for that, her grandfather replied seriously. When I found you and learned about you, I hadn't yet figured out what kind of life you were leading. I was afraid that such news might negatively impact you, as your life had already taken shape by then. But I never doubted one thing, that you were indeed my granddaughter. Look. Grandpa went to the bookshelf and retrieved an album with photographs from the bottom shelf. This is me in my youth. Now my hair is completely gray, but look at how I was back then. Serafina looked at the photo. The young man captured in the picture had fiery red hair, just like herself. Standing beside him in the photo was an older person. His hair had already been touched by gray, but it was clear that it was the same blazing red color. Hair color is a family legacy, Grandpa chuckled. In the photo, next to me, is my father. Two of my other grandchildren have also inherited this hair color. And your dad, my son, was also a fiery redhead. However, we need to have a serious talk, granddaughter, Don Barcenas suddenly changed his tone. Unfortunately, my dear, time is forcing me to hurry. I'm very ill. The doctors have given me very little time, only two to three years, but that's under the condition that I live a calm, tranquil life without stress and worries. Oh, don't cry, Grandpa said, noticing that the news had deeply upset the girl. You're the heir of our lineage, and we've always been strong and confident people. Only my son, Pasquale, didn't follow in our footsteps, but you. You're undoubtedly one of us. Don Barcenas said proudly, and I didn't start this conversation for nothing. As I mentioned earlier, I want to be sure that I'm passing on our family business into capable hands. And now I see that those hands should be yours. Please, wait, don't argue, Don Barcenas said, seeing that his granddaughter was about to object. I understand that there will be a lot for you to learn. And even if something should happen to me, rest assured, there are several trustworthy and time-tested individuals involved in our business who will support you at first. I'm confident that you'll manage everything because you have the most important thing, our family character. And, of course, our family hair color, Grandpa chuckled. Besides, I don't plan on dying right now. On the contrary, I want to live and enjoy life. Grandpa, but I don't need anything from you, Serafina said. The most important thing is that I have you now. Besides, my siblings might get upset and resent me for you wanting to pass on the family business to me. Fina, you shouldn't worry about such things, Grandpa replied. Now you're my successor, and that comes with great responsibility. As for your brother and sister, my other grandchildren, don't worry about them. They'll also receive their share in the will, and our business is unlikely to interest them because what matters most to them is money. Unfortunately, those values were instilled in them by their mother, Agata, my son's ex-wife, and, of course, my ex-wife Irene, who raised my son so wrongly, and I, unfortunately, didn't watch over it. The old man fell silent for a moment. By the way, you'll meet your brother and sister soon. Wanting to talk to you, I called them from Capitol yesterday, and they're already on their way and should be here any minute. Don Barcenas, lunch is ready. The housekeeper entered the living room wearing a neat white apron and stopped in the middle of the room. 
May I serve it? After receiving her employer's permission, the housekeeper disappeared, and from the dining room, there was a faint clinking of dishes. Grandpa and his granddaughter soon sat down for lunch, discussing Serafina's impending meeting with other family members. When the housekeeper brought coffee after lunch, a doorbell rang in the hallway. The host instructed her to go and open the door while he personally poured fragrant hot coffee into delicate porcelain cups. In the meantime, two newcomers entered the dining room, a young man around 20 years old and a woman around 25, both fiery redheads. Serafina immediately understood these were her brother and sister. When they saw the girl, the newcomers were clearly taken aback. They exchanged glances when Grandpa, after a warm greeting, introduced the new family member. When Serafina shook hands with her siblings, she couldn't help but notice their unfriendly glances concealed behind courteous smiles. The brother's name was Gregorio, and the sister's name was Marina. Having declined lunch as they had recently had a snack on the way, the siblings joined Grandpa and Serafina, who were having coffee. They were curious about the girl's life. Upon learning that she had a talent for literature and poetry, they asked her to read them some of her poems. Don Barcenas watched his grandchildren with delight, his face adorned with a happy smile. Evening came, and Serafina was getting ready to go home. She couldn't wait to finally feel like the true owner of her apartment. Don Barcenas bid farewell to his granddaughter with regret, taking her promise that she would come to his house again tomorrow. When Grandpa retired to his office to read and smoke his pipe before sleep, the brother and sister, looking around cautiously, sat down on a small sofa near the fireplace and began to talk quietly. Grego, do you realize what's happening? Marina whispered to her brother. It's her, the daughter of that Kate, the alcoholic. You remember, Mom used to tell us about her, Dad's friend? So... It turns out she did give birth to a child, Marina observed with displeasure. Do you see how Grandpa has taken a liking to her? He's never behaved this way with us. Now we'll probably have to share the inheritance with this loser. You'll see, she'll grab a share of our money, she continued with hatred. Hearing the word money, Gregorio became alert. Do you think Grandpa will leave everything to her? Gregorio looked at his sister with doubt. Well, who knows? Marina replied. The law of meanness hasn't been canceled yet. One thing is clear. We need to get rid of this orphan as soon as possible, by any means. The next day, everyone gathered in the living room of Don Barcenas's house again. After lunch, Grandpa thanked the housekeeper, who had started clearing the table, and turned to his three grandchildren. Well, I see you've gotten acquainted with each other. I'm very glad about that. From now on, Serafina is as much a part of our family as you are, Mara and Grigo. So, I think for you to get to know each other even better, you should spend more time together. Go somewhere, the three of you, have some fun. And you, Fina, I'll be expecting you tomorrow. We still need to sort out the library, Don Barcenas said, hugging his granddaughter by the shoulders. Go for a walk, and I have some business-related matters to attend to today, added Grandpa, heading to his office. When he left, Marina spoke to her sister Serafina in a deliberately cheerful tone. Well, what ideas do you have? You know your city better, so you can lead the way. Where should we go first, and what should we do? Serafina paused and thought. Maybe we could go to the local history museum? She suggested hesitantly, thinking that her brother and sister might not find visiting a museum all that interesting. Gregorio and Marina exchanged meaningful glances. Then Marina, discreetly nudging her brother with her elbow and nodding in Serafina's direction, said to him, What a wonderful idea, don't you think, Grego? Museums are so interesting. I adore them. Yes, it's a great idea, Gregorio chimed in with feigned enthusiasm. We'll definitely visit the local history museum. Serafina, will you invite us to your place? Grandpa told us to get to know each other better, so we're very interested in your life. Plus, you've recently got an apartment, Gregorio added. So, we'd like to come to your place right now. Will you treat us to coffee like a gracious hostess? 
Of course, Serafina replied, thinking that maybe her new relatives weren't as materialistic and petty as Grandpa had described them. Seated in Gregorio's car, the relatives drove to Serafina's home. On the way, Serafina realized that she had nothing to offer her brother and sister as a treat, so she suggested stopping by a store. The family enthusiastically agreed. As Marina and Gregorio filled their cart with groceries and headed to the cashier, Serafina voiced her concern that she might not have enough money for everything, especially since her brother had chosen a fairly expensive bottle of alcohol, explaining that it was necessary to celebrate such an occasion. Oh, don't worry, sister, Gregorio reassured Serafina. We'll cover all the expenses ourselves. We have enough money for that. Your role is just to keep us company and set the table at your apartment like a true hostess. Soon, the siblings entered Serafina's apartment. Marina looked around when she stepped inside, her face displaying poorly concealed disdain. Very cute and cozy, isn't it, Grego? She said to her brother, casting a meaningful glance in Serafina's direction. Meanwhile, Serafina was busy at the table, arranging the snacks they had bought from the store. When everything was ready, her brother opened the bottle. Well, we should celebrate this meeting, he said as he poured the alcohol into glasses. I don't drink, guys, Serafina protested when she saw Gregorio pour a hefty amount of alcohol into her glass. I've only tried champagne once in my life, and I didn't really like it, she added hesitantly. Serafina, how come? Her brother replied in surprise. You don't drink at all? Never? Well, that's commendable, he continued confidently. You're doing great. But you're an adult now, right? You have us, your family. Don't you want to show us some respect? Besides, we're your guests now. Gregorio put on an offended expression. Serafina, Grigo is right, Marina chimed in. You should show us some respect. Maybe you don't know this, but there are certain rules of conduct for hosts who receive guests, and this is a very good drink, and it goes down smoothly. Why don't you have a few sips out of respect? Gregorio promptly raised a toast to celebrate the meeting. Serafina, taking a small sip, realized that the drink was indeed much stronger than she initially thought. Her head started to feel fuzzy, and the room around her seemed to sway, like when she had taken a boat trip on a river. Through the haze, Serafina momentarily felt like she was standing on the deck during one of those river excursions organized by their caregiver Sonora Mulatto during the season. She had a brief sensation of being on one of those excursions. Her thoughts were muddled, and she found herself holding another glass poured by her brother, containing another dose of the intoxicating beverage. Drink, she heard through a fog, and those words echoed in her head, as if bouncing off the walls of a deep stone well. Already on the verge of losing consciousness, Serafina felt something being poured down her throat against her will. Unable to swallow the liquid properly, she began to choke. Hold on, Marina hissed at her brother. She might choke, God forbid. Then you'll have to answer to Grandpa for her. It's known that she left with us. Calm down, everything's under control, Gregorio reassured Serafina in a hushed tone, closely watching her. Oh, looks like she's ready. He stated with satisfaction, taking out his phone and turning on the screen. Let's make a short film for posterity. It might come in handy later if our little sister proves to be uncooperative. And then we'll call Grandpa, right, Fina? He added playfully, dialing his grandpa's number via video call. Come on, sister, tell Grandpa how much you love him. Go ahead. Gregorio placed the phone in front of Serafina's face. The young woman, struggling to open her eyes, looked at the screen. Seeing her grandfather on the screen, she giggled drunkenly and, with a tongue heavy from alcohol, managed to say, Grandpa, hi, it's me. Granddaughter, what's happening? Are you feeling unwell? Her grandfather's voice trembled with concern. No, I'm feeling very good. We just had a bit to drink, Serafina added, her tongue slurring, then she swayed and fell to the floor, instantly falling asleep. Don Barcenas ended the video call. 
The brother and sister, exchanging glances, burst into laughter and high-fived each other. Their plan had worked. Now Grandpa would think a hundred times before making any decisions, now that he had seen what his beloved new granddaughter was capable of. Disconnecting the video call, Don Barcenas clutched his chest. Had he made a mistake in endowing Serafina with qualities she didn't possess? Would she, the child of wayward parents, now follow in their footsteps? I need to go to her immediately. Don Barcenas decided, pressing the button to call the housekeeper. Suddenly, he felt a crushing sensation in his chest, as if it were caught in a vice. He swayed, almost losing consciousness from the pain, but managed to stay on his feet. Soon, the housekeeper arrived in response to his call. Quickly, he said, his voice barely audible. Tell the driver to bring the car. We need to leave urgently, he whispered, then collapsed unconscious. Serafina struggled to open her eyes and looked around in surprise. She was lying on her couch at home, with a table filled with leftover snacks, overturned glasses, and an empty bottle lying on its side nearby. She tried to get up, but her head was spinning dangerously. What happened here? What's going on with me? She wondered aloud. Her memories suddenly flooded back. Her brother and sister, where were they? They had been here, with her. This gathering to celebrate and get to know her relatives. Serafina, turning her head with great effort, glanced at the wall clock, which showed six in the morning. How long had she slept? Apparently, the celebration had stretched into the evening. But what happened afterward? She couldn't remember anything. Did I, did I drink alcohol? She wondered, feeling a strange and unpleasant taste in her mouth. My brother and sister brought alcohol with them yesterday, she remembered. Feeling worse than ever, Serafina managed to get up, went to the kitchen, and put on a kettle. Upon seeing the previous day's snacks, now stale on the plates, she felt a wave of nausea. She had no appetite. After drinking some coffee, she cleared the table, set an alarm for nine in the morning, and lay back down on the couch, falling asleep once more. When she woke up, she took a shower, but her lack of appetite persisted. She began to get ready to visit her grandfather. Usually, she would arrive at his house around 10 in the morning. They would have breakfast together, drink coffee, and then she would start working on organizing her grandfather's library. Today, she realized she might arrive later than usual. Dialing her grandfather's number, Serafina intended to let him know that she would be coming later today. However, there was no answer from his phone. Unable to reach him, Serafina decided to go to his house. The door, as usual, was opened by the housekeeper. To her surprise, Serafina found that no one was home. Why did they all disappear, she wondered. Where is Grandpa? Serafina asked the housekeeper, who had entered the living room and started cleaning up. Don't you know? The housekeeper exclaimed as she dusted the bookshelves. Don Barcenas is in the hospital, in critical condition, he's in the intensive care unit. Sonora Barcenas and Senor Barcenas are with him at the hospital too. Hearing the news, Serafina went cold. So that's why her grandfather hadn't answered her call. After learning from the housekeeper which hospital her grandfather was in, she rushed there immediately. They wouldn't let Serafina see her grandfather. Visits were prohibited in his critical condition. Not knowing what to do, the girl sat down on a couch in the hallway. Here she is. She messed up, and now she's come to admire the result of her screw-up. Serafina suddenly heard a voice beside her. Raising her eyes, the girl saw Marina and Gregorio standing in front of her. What are you looking at? Marina continued. It's all because of you that Grandpa's doing badly, you scoundrel. Why because of me? Serafina didn't understand anything. What happened, anyway? Oh, what happened? Look for yourself. Gregorio, feigning indignation, took out his phone from his pocket, turned it on, and thrust it into the girl's face. On the screen, Serafina saw herself, barely able to speak and sitting at a table with a glass in her hand. Well, how do you like it? Her brother asked mockingly. 
and there's more of those videos. I can show you if you're not too ashamed to watch it yourself, he continued, pointing his finger at the phone screen. Grandpa saw all of this? Serafina was horrified. Why did you show him all of this? He's not supposed to worry at all, the girl said unpleasantly. Look, now she's trying to blame us too. Marina retorted indignantly. You started video calling him yourself yesterday. He felt bad right away when he saw you. You're just like your mother, an alcoholic and a complete mess. Get out of here before we throw you out and make sure we never see you here again, Marina declared angrily to Serafina. Yeah, her brother added mockingly, it happens to everyone, of course, but if you have even a drop of conscience left, it's better if you leave gracefully and forget that you're our sister. Shocked by the news, Serafina silently left the hospital. She couldn't fathom how she could have acted this way. Maybe they're lying to me? She thought. But how could she find out now? Even if her relatives were just trying to blame her for the video call, the evidence that Serafina had consumed alcohol that evening was undeniable. Her grandfather would see it in any case, and in his condition, worrying now. Serafina was horrified at the thought that she might not see her grandfather again. Not knowing what to do next, the girl headed to the children's home where she had spent many long and not entirely bad years of her life. When she encountered unpleasant situations or simply didn't understand things, Serafina always knew who to turn to for help her caregiver, Sonora Mulatto. As she made her way there, the girl suddenly realized that her caregiver still didn't know the news about Don Barcenas and her new relatives. Events had unfolded so quickly that Serafina hadn't even had a chance to share all of this with the person who had become practically a family to her over the years they had spent together. Sonora Mulatto herself, not wanting to interfere with the ward getting used to independent adult life, deliberately did not call Serafina to find out how things were. The caregiver, as always, was at her workplace. Seeing Serafina, she sincerely rejoiced, but immediately realized that the girl had not come to her with good news. When the ward told her everything that had happened over these two days, Sonora Mulatto was simply amazed. Life. It's more twisted than any movie. No one expected such a turn of events. I really don't know what to do now, Sonora Mulatto, Serafina said helplessly, finishing her story. I'm most afraid that my grandfather will start thinking badly of me. As for this inheritance, I immediately said that I didn't need anything, but my grandfather believes that I'm the one suited to be the successor of his family business. Maybe my brother and sister don't want me to be considered the heir to our grandfather's vast fortune either. I'm starting to think that they deliberately staged this alcohol story to discredit me in front of him. Fina, talk to them about it, Sonora Mulatto replied fervently. Promise to give up everything when it comes to the inheritance. And maybe they will back off on their own. In general, my dear, if they are such petty people, it's better to have no relatives like that. I will try to talk to them, of course, Serafina replied with doubt, but I don't know if they'll believe me. When my grandfather talked about them, he spoke very unfavorably about them, saying that besides money, these people are not interested in anything in the world. And our grandfather is a billionaire, Serafina said with meaning. They judge by themselves, and they would never give up such an inheritance themselves. They need full guarantees that I won't get anything. Then you should try to talk to your grandfather and explain everything to him, Sonora Mulatto advised. Moreover, he remains the main figure here, the caregiver confidently added. The girl nodded in agreement and, saying goodbye, left Sonora Mulatto's place. When she went outside, Serafina decided to talk to her relatives once again and headed back to the hospital. They still didn't let her see her grandfather, and there was no sign of Marina and Gregorio anywhere. Asking the nurse who was sitting at the nursing station in the hall, Serafina found out that her relatives had recently gone home. Determined to talk to them, Serafina headed for her grandfather's house. Marina and Gregorio were sitting at the grandfather's dining table, waiting for the maid to clear the dishes after the soup, bring the hot dishes, and leave the dining room. The brother and sister began to eat, discussing the situation that had developed. So, what now? Gregorio asked, 
gnawing on a roasted turkey leg. Maybe our little sister has already been neutralized, and we can relax on her account? I doubt it, Marina replied, dabbing her lips with a starched napkin. We don't know what our grandfather will say when he gets better. And don't forget that as soon as he came to his senses, he immediately called a notary to the hospital. The sister shook her head significantly. What does that mean? It's unclear for now. Well, maybe he decided to change something in our favor. Gregorio suggested. Why all of a sudden, if we already considered ourselves the main heirs? Marina retorted. I think the most important thing is not to let this Serafina explain herself to our grandfather. Let her remain a flawed daughter of her alcoholic mother in his eyes, like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and so on. Couldn't handle her alcohol, broke loose. How can we entrust her with our business after that? But he wasn't planning to entrust us with the family business either, the brother remarked. Grego, why do we even need it? The sister responded. We should get the inheritance, and then we can push grandfather into a more expensive business, divide the money, and that's it. The relative's discussion was interrupted by an unexpected knock at the door. The maid went to answer it. Serafina entered the dining room. Here she is, our cheerful little sister exclaimed Gregorio when he saw her. I need to talk to you, Serafina said firmly. Listen to me. Well, go ahead, said Marina as the eldest, without inviting her sister to sit at the table. Serafina remained standing in front of her family like a guilty schoolgirl. Grandfather was right about them, she thought and said. I want you to hear me now. I don't need your fortune, understand. Most likely, you deliberately staged this story with alcohol to discredit me in front of grandfather. But remember, I have never drunk, I don't drink, and I don't intend to, no matter who my mother is. So, I don't want grandfather to think badly of me, and I'm going to explain the situation to him, and you just don't interfere. Look at her, Marina said with feigned surprise. Our little girl is showing character, like she's a worthy descendant of our family and all that. You're nobody, remember, Marina said firmly. You won't talk to grandfather, understood? Where's the guarantee that you won't deceive him and he won't leave you all his estate? We don't want to be left with nothing, got it? Grandfather was right about you, Serafina said confidently. Money is the only value in your life. And what if I give my word right now that I'll give up everything? Brother and sister exchanged glances and burst into loud laughter. Either you're completely crazy or too cunning, said Marina, still laughing. Who in their right mind would voluntarily give up a multi-million dollar fortune? That's enough of playing games with our heads, the sister decisively concluded. You leave here now and never come back. And if you disobey, know that grandfather will see all those videos that Grego shot during that party. And our grandfather absolutely cannot be upset, Marina added mockingly. In the hallway, the phone rang. The maid answered the call and, after a brief conversation, hung up. Entering the dining room, she informed the three young masters. Sonora Marina Barcenas, Senor Gregorio Barcenas, Sonora Serafina Padilla, they called from the hospital. Your grandfather, Don Barcenas, has just passed away. His heart stopped and all the measures taken by the doctors had no effect. What a piece of news! exclaimed Gregorio, surprised. Unexpected. Well, what now? Marina said emphatically, addressing Serafina. I hope the issue is settled now. You won't be able to talk to Grandfather anyway, so we don't detain you here anymore. I hope you haven't changed your mind about the inheritance. Are you refusing, as you assured us earlier? So, yes or no? I don't want anything from you, Serafina cried bitterly. Grandfather, how could this happen? I just found out about you not long ago, and now I've lost you, she sobbed. How touching. I'll cry too now, Gregorio cynically pretended to mourn. Well, if we've clarified everything, then goodbye, Marina said, paying no attention to Serafina's tears. And, by the way, don't even think about showing up at the funeral. You have no business there. 
And you know, my advice, forget this whole story as soon as possible, Marina added coldly. Devastated by grief, Serafina left her grandfather's house and went wherever her eyes led her. She simply didn't know how to go on living, blaming herself for his death. Her brother and sister had acted despicably, but where had she been looking? Suddenly, the girl realized where her feet were leading her. Ahead, the familiar stone fence of her childhood home loomed. Unable to hold back her tears, Serafina found Sonora Mulatto and cried on her chest. The frightened woman rushed to get a sedative, not understanding what was happening and not knowing how to calm the girl. Pouring water into a glass and adding the medication, the caregiver almost forced the girl to drink its contents. While the girl drank from the glass, struggling to swallow, the caregiver patiently waited, knowing that something terrible had happened. Finally, Serafina calmed down a bit and managed to tell what had happened. Poor girl, how many hardships she has endured in her short life, thought Sonora Mulatto, patting Serafina on the head. You know, I would still go to the funeral if I were you, Sonora Mulatto confidently said. You are just as much a granddaughter as your brother and sister. If you've decided to renounce the inheritance out of your family rights, then you certainly have the right to say goodbye to your grandfather. Especially since you couldn't see him by the will of your relatives. But I still don't understand why you decided not to accept the inheritance along with your brother and sister. You've made a mistake by going along with them, the caregiver added. Serafina didn't reply. Her strength was depleted, and all she wanted was to rest and forget about everything. Encouraged by Sonora Mulatto, the girl calmed down a bit and went home. When she reached her apartment, she immediately lay down on her bed and fell into a deep sleep. The grandfather's funeral was scheduled for three days later. After giving it some thought, Serafina decided that Sonora Mulatto was right. No one had the right to prevent her from saying goodbye to her relative. Serafina dialed the phone number of her grandfather's mansion, and as usual, the call was answered by the housekeeper, who informed her that the young masters were not at home. Serafina asked the woman to tell her the time and place of the funeral. The young masters instructed the staff not to let Serafina into the house and even to avoid any contact with her. After hesitating for a moment, the housekeeper secretly provided the girl with the time and location of the funeral. The young masters did not sit well with the experienced woman. As soon as they felt like heirs, the brother and sister immediately started behaving disrespectfully and rudely towards her. Don Barcenas and Serafina had never allowed such behavior. Serafina sincerely thanked the housekeeper and firmly decided to attend the funeral. At the appointed time, trying not to attract attention and avoiding Marina and Gregorio, she arrived at the funeral home. The ceremony had already begun. During the service, Serafina stood behind everyone, trying to see through the mourners dressed in black who were surrounding her grandfather's coffin. She noticed Marina and Gregorio in the front row right away. Around them, other people, relatives, friends, and associates of Don Barcenas were milling about. Marina kept looking around and whispering to two women in mourning who stood beside her. Probably, it's their mother and grandmother of my grandfather's ex-wife, thought Serafina. Finally, the ceremony was over, and it was time for the farewell. Pretending deep sorrow, Marina and Gregorio were the first to approach the coffin, followed by the other attendees. Waiting for her brother and sister to leave the building, Serafina looked around and timidly approached the coffin. She gazed at her grandfather, unable to hold back her tears. Suddenly, Serafina noticed a piercing gaze in her direction. An older woman in a mourning hat with a veil, who had stood next to her brother and sister during the ceremony, stared at her suspiciously. Eventually, she decisively approached Serafina and said angrily, Is this the supposedly newly discovered granddaughter of my ex-husband? Judging by the hair color, it must be you. Do you think that being a redhead automatically makes you the heir? Maybe you've dyed your hair. The woman shouted. What happened, Grandma? Marina and Gregorio appeared nearby. Ah, so here she is, the sly snake, hissed Marina, noticing Serafina. Get out of here. Quickly. Grego, come help me. 
Grabbing the girl by the arms from both sides, her relatives forcibly dragged her towards the exit. The grandmother, who had lost her composure entirely, pushed Serafina angrily from behind. Once outside, her relatives forcefully threw her to the ground. Well, there you go, leaning over Serafina directly in her face, Marina said sternly, I see you don't understand words. So know this, the inheritance was ours, is ours, and will continue to be ours. And you, simpleton, will remain nobody, just as you were. If I ever see you again in my life, you will regret it, I promise. We won't stop at anything, so keep that in mind. The participants in the funeral and the relatives settled into the hearse. They closed the coffin with Don Barcenas's body and loaded it onto the vehicle. The hearse departed for the cemetery. Serafina struggled to her feet and went home. Her relatives had worried in vain. She hadn't even considered claiming the inheritance and had no desire to know when and where her grandfather's will would be read. The next day passed in a fog. Serafina, calling the mansion again, spoke to the housekeeper to find out where her grandfather had been buried. However, the housekeeper strongly urged her not to go to the cemetery for now. The new owners demanded that she, the housekeeper, not under any circumstances disclose the burial location to Serafina. After the reading of the will tomorrow, all the relatives would return to capital, and then they could visit Don Barcenas's grave together with Serafina. Thanking the woman, Serafina hung up. She needed to start rebuilding her life somehow. After getting ready, she went to work at the store where Sonora Mulatto had arranged a job for her with the director. However, soon after, when the notary publicly read the will, the relatives couldn't believe their ears. What the notary read after opening the sealed envelope containing the will left the heirs in unimaginable disbelief and anger. This is provocation. This can't be. All the relatives shouted at once. The grandmother, unable to comprehend what she had heard, lost consciousness and slumped to the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I kindly ask for silence, the notary said. Everything is done legally. I can provide concrete evidence that the late Don Barcenas gave me instructions regarding his will in the presence of witnesses and while of sound mind. In addition to all the documents, I also have video footage of this process taken by a specially appointed person. Therefore, challenging the will is likely to be unsuccessful. Don Barcenas also left a separate letter addressed to the heiress. By the way, where is she? The notary looked around at the relatives sitting at the table in the notary's office. Serafina was cleaning her apartment. Tomorrow would be her first day at work in the store. She decided that in the coming days, she wouldn't have time for cleaning, so she wanted to tidy up in advance. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Dropping a wet rag, Serafina left it on the floor and went to answer the door. There stood a young man in a business suit. Are you Serafina Padilla? He asked the girl. I'm the assistant to the notary whom your grandfather, Don Barcenas, entrusted with preparing his will. You are urgently needed at the reading. I've been instructed to bring you to the notary's office right away. Please set aside all your tasks for now and come with me. Everyone is waiting for you. Serafina's appearance sparked audible discontent among the relatives. The notary called for silence, and they all fell quiet as he continued. Don Barcenas entrusted me, in the presence of all the relatives, to read a letter addressed to his heiress, Serafina Padilla. The text of this letter exists in written form, and it is also recorded on video, where the late Don Barcenas himself reads its contents. Please familiarize yourselves with it, said the notary and began reading the letter. My dear granddaughter Fina, I suspect you won't be very pleased with what you hear, and there are reasons for that, but I've thought everything through carefully before making arrangements in case of my death. Know that I have never doubted you for a second. I was, am, and always will be convinced that you are the most deserving heir to my estate. Therefore, I leave all my movable and immovable property, as well as our family business, solely to you. I implore you not to reject such a gift and not to succumb to the provocations of your new relatives. You are the only hope for our family business. I know that my time is short, so I earnestly request that you fulfill my final wish. 
Do not doubt yourself, and do not fear that you won't be able to handle this significant and new responsibility. Soon, trusted individuals who have stood the test of time, my associates and friends, will contact you. They will mentor you, work hand in hand with you, and lead our business while you continue your studies at the Institute. Regarding your brother and sister, Marina and Gregorio, I have instructions for you as well. Employ your siblings in one of our enterprises of their choice. It will be beneficial for them to start earning an honest living. If they refuse to do so, do not insist. However, in this case, Marina and Gregorio will have to find their own means of support, as after your inheritance, financial support will continue to be paid only to my former wife, Irene, due to her advanced age. Your brother and sister will no longer receive this support from that moment onwards. Don't be afraid, my girl. I am confident that you will handle any task, no matter how challenging it may seem. I believe in you unconditionally. Your loving grandfather. The notary finished reading, and a heavy silence hung in the room. Everyone awaited the heiress's response. Serafina cried inconsolably, unable to utter a word. Well then, the will has been announced, the notary summed up. Heiress Serafina Padilla, in accordance with the law, assumes her inheritance rights. I kindly ask everyone to sign the documents. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.